our Philip King is here with his selection of music in The South Wind Blows. Now it's time for us to join Theo Dorgan. Good evening and welcome to the Poetry Programme. My guest this week is Patrick Dealey, author of the recently published The Bones of Creation. And how better to start than with a poem? Paddy, what about ghosts? Yes, Theo, thanks very much. I'll start with ghosts. They pass themselves off as the heron standing among shadows in crepuscular water. The flitting bat, the owl patenting a figment of flying saucer. We hear them speak in garbled languages, trills, ululations that open to our every guess, floating bodiless above these woods and conurbations. Even at stroke of midnight, they sing or are the wind rushing ahead of us, where twelve birch trees huddle white-legged beside the tumbling dodder. Strange, they make us think not at all morbidly of the dying ground into which we soon must sleep our worries done, but rather would have us marvel at this dream that raises the owl, the bat, the heron, the wind and the song. Ghosts, the reason why we venture, the story of ourselves living our lucky hour. Has it been a lucky hour for you, your life as a poet? I think so, all things considered. I'm a positive by nature, Theo, and I live in the best of times, the worst of times, and that's unoriginal, but it's true still for me. I make the best of things. I'm lucky, I think, especially in the sense that I have that special love of nature. I know lots of people do, but for me, nature is a very personal thing, very particular thing. Well, I mean, it, in, in your three collections to date, I mean, they're, they're, it's a fact the kind of nature mysticism is how it comes across. Mm. Even the, the way the words lock together, it sort of enacts all the boniness and the slitherings and the slushiness yes, of things. That doesn't come from the wind. It comes from, I suppose, where I was born and grew up. And I, does it come out of your ancestors as well? You had a grandmother who was, who was a ballad maker. I did indeed. Uh, she rejoiced in the name Molly Head and she wrote poems very much about her lo locality, uh, about the local horse fair, the country fair in Banlaslow. Did you learn them when you were a kid? Did you know I the I read them. I didn't learn them off. Hmm. They were uh, interesting in for me in a, for a different reason. They were interesting in that they gave me a sense that you could write about experiences, your own ordinary experiences, day-to-day -day experiences, away from the kind of, I suppose, efficient and official language of uh, school books. And it, they validated experience and made me feel it could be documented. Did they make you feel better about the poems you were learning in school? I won't say yes totally to that. Um, I would say I didn't particularly like poetry at school. I found maybe that there was too much of trying to decipher the meaning of poetry at school. I think of Humpty Dumpty there in uh, Through the Looking Glass, where he says to Alice, he says, I can explain every poem that's ever been written and some that haven't been invented yet. And I thought that was a little bit of a mistake, maybe in terms of the way we were taught poetry then, truly with the best will of the, in the world of the teachers. And in your own formation as a teacher, I mean, were you taught to teach poetry? Yes, we were taught all the curricular areas uh, in primary school. Were you taught how to teach? Was there a style for putting poetry across? There was a curriculum, which was the 1974 curriculum, which has since been revised and to a much better effect, I think, in terms of putting the child much more to the centre of the curriculum. And if the child's at the centre, and English is one of the curricular areas, well, you can use uh, poetry as a, a vehicle towards literacy for a child. And you can really uh, use your own imagination, use the child's imagination, use sources uh, from the child's community. And I, I liked that when I was working in the classroom. I did, uh, I did workshops in English and in poetry a lot with the young children, I thought. There was a kind of a keepsake at the end of it for each child. He got, um, he got a, a poetry book of his own and we got a, a communal poetry, poetry book for the class, which we, which we sold in the community. We sold in the local shops in Ballyfermot, where I work. So do you think of poetry as a communal thing? I rather than a private thing. I think it begins as a private thing. The, yes. the, the poet really can't afford to be have someone looking over his or her shoulder. But I think ultimately it does become a communal thing and I suppose it should do. It's out there and it then can be taken or left. You know, it's something that uh, it's a gift to the world, I would say, in the sense that uh, it doesn't use up anything particularly to, to, to write it. it um, is given out and has a ripple effect in the sense that people can take it or leave it. It may influence people. It adds to the store of human experience and human culture. And what tempted you into making poems? How old were you when you started writing? 
I wasn't that young. I was in my early 20s. Um, what tempted me, I think, was uh, seeing the power of language in uh, a relation of my father, Seamus O'Kelly, who is author of The Weaver's Grave, as you know. Uh, when I read The Weaver's Grave as a teenager, I thought it was very powerful, and it gave me an eye-opener and an ear near full of what poetry could do. And, of course, you try to emulate your heroes, and the fact that your hero was related to you was a, a double bind for me also my grandmother and her input. And the fact, I think, that I went away from home, I went away from the wetland meadows where I grew up, away from County Galway, and that I was in Dublin and learning to adjust to Dublin life, that gave me that distance, which let me filter things, maybe, and uh, create that necessary distance as well to write the poems. Of course, the great black cloud on the horizon for a young poet moving to Dublin from the country was the, the, the redoubtable Mr. Kavanagh. The was redoubtable. he there for you? Was Kavanagh he on was, the horizon? I, I have to, and it's not a confession, it's a, it's, a, it's a good admission on my part. I think it was one of the first poets I read, um, and I loved his poetry, but uh, I was always conscious of trying to absorb it. I wouldn't say I was spiritual in the way he is, uh, and so therefore I was going at a different angle. I was much more, as you may have said, bony and uh, more of the earth in the sense of the stone and the grit and the graft of nature itself, uh, more than the, the sacred or spiritual element to it. But there's no sense either in any of your books that, um, that this is anything you particularly needed to shake off your boots. I mean, you return in delight time and time again to the natural landscape, to the world that's full of being itself. That's true, Theo. I, I suppose I'm going back, in a sense, now to earlier poems, revisiting them in a sense, but in a sense to, to maybe capture it better. I think there's a sense uh, for me that writing poetry is about, I suppose, reliving experience to an extent, uh, enlivening, deepening experience, uh, holding it for a while. And there's that tremendous sense of uh, stillness and serious focus when I'm writing a poem. And there's that pleasure of a preoccupied feeling. Is there something wrong in the nature of our times that people find it so difficult to find that stillness in themselves, even enough stillness to read a poem? Yeah, I think uh, I'm quite hyperactive myself in my life. I, it gives me energy, and I love that. Mm. And that's my daytime uh, thing, to be busy and on the go. My nighttime thing is to be quiet and to try and read and write poems. And I do agree that we are hurried. We're hurried by our environment, definitely. I think um, my uncle, uh, one of my uncles who came back from America at one point, he said to my mother, he says, Mary, how can you spend your life looking out of that bush there, outside that window? And she had never even thought about it in those terms before. But he, as a man who had lived America, who had soaked it up and who had spat it out... And could he, you spend a day looking at a bush? I could indeed. No That's, bother to you. I can... You know John McGarren's idea of trying to outsit and outstare nature. Mm. I think that's a wonderfully pleasurable thing to do. Well, Kavanaugh aside, and I mean, Kavanaugh, I suppose, was inescapable. Most people in their beginnings as poets, they have a couple of presences at the shoulder, you know, people whose work has influenced them, people maybe they're trying to emulate at the very start and then have to escape. Who would those be for you? Theodore Rethke. Um, I actually met Theodore when I was a young fellow. I met him in Broderick's of Kilrigal, a great hostelry then and still a great hostelry, and he actually bought my father a pint. Now, I didn't realise who he was until years later when I saw him in the Faber book of uh, modern verse, I think. Was he on his way into or out of Balnuslaw at that stage? He was on his way in, I would say. Yeah. Yes, he was indeed, sadly. Yeah. And what kind of man was he? How did he impress you? Generous, I suppose. Um, awkward and a little bit, maybe, from what I can recall of him, a person who liked ordinary people and who stood around to all the workmen in the pub. Right, and he had um, he would have clay under the fingernails, yeah. no bother in the greenhouses. He did, and that's another thing. Uh, speaking about his influence on me, he had that in that influence of the greenhouse and his father's greenhouse. And I had the sawmill and the workshop at home, my father's uh, two uh, occupations. And I think both uh, Theodore Rethke and myself were maybe equally awkward around practical things which gave us a reason to maybe to go back to them. But also conscious that being awkward around practical things put you in a certain relationship with a practical father. It did. I wanted to learn how to make a hurley. I wanted to watch his craft. And I think it's wonderful to watch somebody who is so maybe graceful and gifted with their manual work that they do, that they don't consider it, you know. And from my point of view, it seemed a good thing to do to consider how he did it, to learn the language, the real language, as opposed to the meta language, you know, where he might talk about the boss 
or the grain uh, or the warp of the hurry or the or the, the dip in the well of the bench, the well of the bench. Those kind of terms really got me. And plus the wrenches and the wonderful apparatus around it all. And the magic, of course, of how the tree becomes, the hurdle becomes the instrument of magic on the field again. Indeed. So well, it's all the, transformation through craft. Yes, as I say, another It's poem. all very cosmic, Paddy. It's isn't very it? cosmic. Well, <laughs> well, the, the, I suppose um, the, the hurley, as I said somewhere else in another poem, the hurley asleep in ash and then singing later on yeah. on fields of for the Sunday. And who else besides Ruthke? Um, well, as we mentioned, Kavna, and I suppose Robert Frost. Uh, you can see there, I'm, a, I'm from a certain lineage, which is mm. a very proud lineage. Um, Robert Frost, I thought he had that great grace as a poet, whereby he was able to say in his best poems very profound things in, in, in a seemingly simple language, which, mm. which wasn't. Did that appeal to you, the, 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 the art that conceals art, the, the apparent simplicity of Frost, but the complex things going on beneath the surface? I agree totally with that, and I think that... that but did you want to emulate that? Of course, uh, to, to tease out the knotted line, Theo, in a way, you know, mm. I'm still working on that. Uh, the craft of poetry is one which you don't learn. I reckon it takes a lifetime to learn and maybe not then. It's a thing I'm still involved with. We'll always be trying to learn. And uh, that because I suppose we, we can see where we have to go. When we look back at the great canon of literature in English poetry, English poets, you could easily feel overwhelmed by it. But it's not about that. It's not about emulating. It's about matching up to what you yourself feel. Uh, will justify and cover the experiences you've had and make standing into the line standing into the line yeah a, a, a poem that that actually touches on some of those things that i quite like is millennium mm -hmm. also from the bones of creation maybe you'd read that for us yes it's it's i suppose it's rules and herbs uh, maybe i cheat a little bit in terms of my dublin poems but i don't think of it like that i love the idea of a weed breaking through a grid or i love the idea of nature emerging somewhere and of course uh, in as long as it's not a lilac on your chimney, you also have a problem <laughs> about ruthlessly climbing the house and ruthlessly pulling this Actually, harmless, inoffensive lilac out of its home I, in your red brick chimney. I did climb, but the poem stopped me from pulling the, 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 the lilac. Ah, go on. Read Millennium for us, Paddy. Millennium. The mill of traffic unhinges. Bleep and glare dwindle to silence and to grey. We take in the high broken window through which birds loop the chimney sprouting a sycamore tree. Our Thomas streets slovenly ancient. Pound shops hold, steaming Guinness stacks, all that runs to ruins illumined by fine art students and Harry Clark. While yet a big yellow crane lifts something gone bust, the old tailor's bereft and won't be back. Further, Robert Emmett is hanged, drawn and quartered in a heroin fix outside St. Catherine's. But Digital Hub, how are you? And Cobble Lane, greened by downflow. No wild cascade, just a slick of wetness, sliming some citizen's shed, his wall and bed, since before whenever. Now, when you were reading that, all I'm hearing is um, a big yellow crane lifts something gone bust. Twelve months ago, that line would have gone by unremarkable. Now it's acquired a kind of an eerie double resonance. It's kind of its shadow self in behind it. That's because true. the cranes are hanging over, now in Dublin, they're hanging over sites that have gone dark and silent. That's true. There's something eerie in poetry always, I think, that where you write the line and it's there, and then something shifts in history and the line takes on a new meaning. Do you yes. get that sense from your own poems? Do you go um, back to him and say, I didn't know I was saying that? I don't see myself as being prophetic, if that's what you mean. But sometimes, maybe by happy or unhappy chance, you may be proved to be prophetic in your poetry. Um, you're right, uh, the landscape has changed. Uh, we are in recession. But I would say to you uh, that I, through the boom times, and I'm not really commenting too much on society, but to say that I knew an awful lot of people who weren't touched by the boom at all and whose lives were still that same struggle that it is and will be. We've been told over and over again in the last two decades that rural Ireland's dead and gone, a myth for Conor and Ophel on, if I can you know, misquote Montague. Not in your poems, it isn't. I mean, as far as you're concerned, rural Ireland is as viable and as vibrant as it ever was. But changed, Theo. Yeah. You know, um, 
there is no doubt that there, there are aspects of rural life which, where the community still holds, where the GA is very strong and other sporting bodies, where there is that sense of people knowing each other. But the landscape has changed. The landscape is under pressure. Where, the, where there was a hub, let's say, 50 years ago in an mm. old uh, cabin, there is now the digital, uh, there's now a hub. And where there was a lantern, uh, where there was a, a jack the lantern, there's a lantern, a 50 or 100 watt lantern burning in a hall. Uh, my callows has been drained largely and changed. And as I say, the, the cow path uh, has turned into the motorway. And boomed into a motorway. Boomed into a motorway, upon, yeah. correct, yeah. yeah so is, there is, is that change. Bad? No, there's a lot of good in it. Uh, I mean, uh, the old life was uh, unsentimentally harsh. And, we, and those of us who maybe didn't fully experience it can look back in a very sentimental and soft uh, way about it. Uh, but uh, no, I wouldn't think that at all. I think there is an awful lot of good. Uh, I just think there needs maybe a readjustment back towards the community now in recessionary times, back towards the community from the individual, uh, where the focus is on the changed community, the immigrants who have come among us and who are living with us, and that sense of inclusion and that sense of openness that we need to bring uh, to bear in our communities. Yeah, let, let me just look at another piece of your life, which because you're principal of a primary school in Ballyfermot, mm -hmm. which is about as Dublin and as urban as you can get on this island. Yes. Um, is that a challenge to your idea of what your poetry should be doing? Um, it's an interesting question. I suppose it is. I, I would say about myself in terms of where I work, the people there who would be parents of the boys in my school, they would be aware of um, the fact that I wrote poems, whether they read them or not is another matter. Do your staff read poems? Some of them do, and uh, I'd say they all do, but maybe not my poems necessarily. I suppose uh, when we were, when I was in the classroom, there was that sense of, of working uh, with the children in terms of getting them to write their own poems, and I'd be more interested in that than in them perceiving my poetry as being rural or urban. You know what I mean? I thought it was great to source the community. I, I was, it was interesting to, I wrote to various grandparents and they wrote me back stories from 30, 40, 50 years ago, back from back to Cork Street, back to Thomas Street, the very place we mentioned in the last poem. And I got them and they, their own grandchildren got them to give the information. The children then used that source, that community thing, and they wrote their poems out of that, uh, as well as other things. But poetry for children is, uh, we're not trying to make poets out of children. We're just trying to teach them a delight in language. And maybe when they're older, maybe they'll pick up a book of poems, maybe even my book of poems and read it. And what do you hope they'll find in poems? Not necessarily in yours, but in poems. What do you hope children will find in poems? Uh, I would say, I would hope that they would find uh, delight in language, as I said. I would hope that they would gain confidence from the idea of an insight, you know, insight from other people's experience. Everyone has their story to tell. Some of us tell it in poetry. Some of us tell it in an anecdote uh, on the bar stool with a friend. Some of us tell it while we're doing a job out on the street, you know. So th th all the stories are equally valid. Uh, but I think that poetry, when it's relevant and when it connects with somebody, it can really give them a sense, a special distilled sense of um, the importance of language, the importance of self-expression, however they may choose to bring that about. You keep coming back to community and source, community and source, and images of the river and of wells run through your, through your books. Do you have the sense that uh, you've been handed a duty, albeit a pleasant duty, to pass something on, a way of looking at the world, a way of using language, that it's, a, that it's somehow an, a, an inherited responsibility? I would be wary of the idea of duty, Theo, but I would see it maybe not necessarily as my gift, but I would see poetry generally or the poem as a gift. The poem as a gift, that might sound a little bit twee, but I don't mean it like that. I think the poem is the gift to the world in the sense that it, it can't really be sold or bought, it can't be used up, or it can't really be wiped out the way other things can be. And if you're writing a poem, insofar as I can answer your question, if you're writing a poem about landscape, about the ecosystem, about the environment, about the grounded humble things, the sturdy humble things that I'm interested in, I think um, it's good to celebrate those. Hopefully other people will share my opinion about those things as being valuable, as being worth maintaining. And if I could branch on from that a little bit, Poetry itself is one of the things maybe that, that loses out in terms of recession. You know, I, I felt sorry about, about the Irish Writers' Centre recently that the funding was withdrawn on that one. I thought it was important that that should stay because it was viable and it was another source, another outlet for poets. And I'm speaking as somebody who's read there once or twice. Um, I think it seems that poetry sometimes, without preaching about it, poetry sometimes is seen as a luxury. It's not a luxury. Poetry is a gift and the gift is all the more special in the sense that it creates a ripple effect. The person who receives it can take it or leave it. It can have strange and wonderful repercussions. But your experience and mine, and we're of much of an age, in fact, we're exactly the same age, both born in the, in the early 1950s, 
we know that in good times and in bad times, poetry finds its way. Isn't there it something does. to be confident about in that, that it finds its way, if not through this structure, then through this other way? Absolutely. But and it doesn't go away. Isn't it mysterious in a way that poetry doesn't go away? Well, it doesn't go away. Poetry is that, that great gift of portability as well, and it's you don't need uh, much to... And a very low carbon footprint. A very low carbon footprint, piece, piece of paper and a pencil, and away you go, or a computer for that matter. It doesn't matter how you come to it. It, it does last, and I suppose people have that in themselves that they want to get out or that they want to express themselves and I think if you can be if you can be open as I say and yet hold tight to what you hold dear you can be you can have some you can say something as a poet that might matter when you go back to the home place and the things you've been saying in poems now that they speak back to the guys you grew up with the boys and girls who were your companions as, as, as when you were all children I think they do uh, in some respects anyway because when I read back in the West of Ireland, I tend to get a non-literary audience, if I could put it like that. And it's wonderful to get the reaction from people in terms of uh, maybe they're there because sometimes they're wondering who I'm writing about. But I think it becomes more than that in terms of the reading. And they say to me, stuff as they would say to yourself as a poet, if you can bring a poem across, well, they think... Well, you're not just. Uh, I, I had this. I, I had these preconceived ideas about poetry. Now I've changed my mind. You know. Right, and of course, poets have often have preconceived ideas about the inability of certain kinds of audience to hear and understand what they're saying. That's true. And Do I you feel you're a voice of your own people in that in that sense of the local? Do you I, feel that their stories are somehow their memories are also being unpacked in your poems? I think that is true to an extent, although I'd be wary of it. But, I, I, for instance, there, were, there was a Shanaki uh, back in my house. We had a rambling house. You, you, you'd be aware of that. Yeah. And he used to visit. He never did a tap of work. He was a very big man. He, li he died recently, age 94. He didn't work, and all the hardy men who worked to die young. There, a lesson, a lesson there, there for all of us. But, yeah. but he, was, he was a person who was the, the storehouse of, of information, knowledge, uh, all the folklore and so on. And... I suppose he, he kind of died in a sense the day the TV was switched on in the corner and he blinked and left. And there's a poem about that there. But I suppose... Do you have the sense that when all the televisions are gone and the electricity has gone and we're back down on what we always had again, that we'll always still have poems? Do you think that? Or will poetry get swept out with the flood as well? Poetry won't get swept out with the flood, I think, because it's natural. It's coming from people themselves. And I think that that will sustain it in good times and in bad. Well, one of the things that sustained Irish poetry down through the millennia is the perpetual appearance of the blackbird in it. And ever since the, the marginal interpolations in the old manuscripts. That's so true. perhaps I could ask you to read, just to take us out of this part of the programme, Birdsong. Yes, and uh, I'm thinking back to the Blackbird by Belfast Loch, but this is not that. It's a more recent Blackbird and bird song. Perspectives through sound. A Blackbird's oath, sworn from a chimney stack. The mellifluous coos of wood pigeons, conjuring sunbeams amid high ivy clusters. A robin's pipe, happening to approve of cotoni aster berries. But if the tremulous, piercing notes of the thrush are expansions of space and time, rolling me wide and far, I still hear the magpie's screeched assertion from a wall overlooking the covered-in quarry that all was winter yesterday, was stone the day before. Stone the day before, Paddy, and who knows what tomorrow. Now, stay with me, because um, all through this series, we're going to reach back into the radio archives and we're going to draw up somebody whose poems perhaps we all know, but we may not be familiar with the voice of the poet herself or himself speaking it. As it happens, I know you're going to be reading in court, aren't you, this year at the festival? Right. This was recorded in court back in the early 90s, and it's that wonderful American poet, Gary Snyder. Here's a poem from No Nature called Ripples on the Surface. Ripples on the surface of the water were silver salmon passing under different from the ripples caused by breezes. A scudding plume on the wave. A humpback whale is breaking out in air, up gulping herring. Nature, not a book, but a performance, a high old culture. Ever fresh events scraped out, rubbed out, and used, used again the braided channels of the rivers, hidden under fields of grass, the vast wild, the house alone, 
the little house in the wild, the wild in the house, both forgotten, no nature, both together, one big empty house. The wonderful Gary Snyder there, recorded in 1993 at Court Festival in Galway. My thanks to Patrick Dealey, our guest this week. The Bones of Creation is his most recent publication. It's published by the Daedalus Press. And that's it from us for this week. Do join us again next week. Until then, good night. The Poetry Programme is presented by Theo Dorgan and produced by Seamus Hosey. A Harold Pinter double bill tribute on RTE Radio 1 starring Peter...